talking about from from the biggest to the smallest, why do you think the Planck scale exists? Well, um, it's an interesting mathematical fact that if you just take certain constants of nature that we've measured, Newton's universal gravitational constant, usually called G, H-bar, Planck's constant, that speaks to the quantum effects, and C, the speed of light. If you take these constants and you combine them in just the right way, you can make the units come out to a length, and the particular length we call the Planck length, and it's a particular number, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And so, so from a from a purely methodological perspective, we understand why there seems to be a fundamental length built into the laws of physics. You need units, and those units are such that they can conspire to yield this fundamental length scale. From a more philosophical perspective, we suspect it's because the laws of physics as we understand them only work down to a particular length scale. As we probe the universe on ever shorter scales, we've encountered newer and unexpected phenomenon. But it's possible that the very notion of a smaller length doesn't always make any sense. There may come a length where the notion of a smaller length is a concept that doesn't mean anything any longer. And if that idea, if that chain of reasoning is true, then that is another rationale for the Planck length. The Planck length would be that length below which, the notion of below which doesn't mean anything. And, and so if there is such a length, the Planck length would be it. It's so cool. I saw a, um, a theory online where someone said that the reason the Planck length exists is because we're in a simulation and that's the size of the pixels. <laughs> essentially that that's the smallest amount of bit information that could be transmitted so that's that's why it's there i thought that was quite a cute a cute way to put yeah, it yeah but, but whenever i hear things like that my rejoinder to that is but if you had a really clever programmer the programmer could make the sentient beings in that simulation think that there wasn't a plank length because the programmer is in control of the reality and therefore can make the simulants, you and I, think whatever the programmer wants us to think. So I'm less convinced that real constraints from the physical universe necessarily have a home in a simulated universe. Or maybe he's put it in as a red herring so that he th that Brian Green guy thinks that he knows what's going on. Yeah, so that's the other, the other, the, the, the flip side is that the simulator can, again, conjure things that have no basis in reality. Um, so, yeah, the interplay between physical reality and the reality that the simulator creates, that's a, that's a subtle one, and I suspect it's in the hands of the simulator, in the hands of the creator, and therefore crossing over between the two always feels to me suspect. Can you just explain for me the Copenhagen interpretation I really want to try and cut through. This seems to be like the woo-woo element of physics that gets thrown around and is excuse for all manner of bad thinking. Can you just try and break down yeah. what it is and what it isn't? Well, different people will answer this question differently in the community today. So it's not a fully well-defined notion, the Copenhagen interpretation. But my view and it's shared by many other physicists as well, is that, look, Niels Bohr, who was one of the founding pioneers of quantum physics, who was working in Copenhagen, had a particular attitude about quantum mechanics. And any interpretation of quantum mechanics that captures that attitude is what we call the Copenhagen approach. And his attitude was quantum mechanics is not about describing the universe as it is. This is almost a quote of his. Quantum mechanics is about describing the universe as it is. It's all about just making predictions for what we'll see on devices, on counters, on, on measurers, on, on instruments. So Bohr was basically, don't think about the meaning of quantum mechanics. Don't think about the deep nature of reality. Just think about quantum mechanics as a tool. And as a tool, you should just use it to make predictions about the world. And, and so he viewed quantum mechanics as a mathematical algorithm. Follow these steps, and we can teach these steps to any undergraduate, even high school kids. We can teach them, follow these steps, and it will yield a number. 
and then compare that number with the number you get on a dial. And that to me is the most concrete form of the Copenhagen interpretation. Now others will say things like, no, the Copenhagen interpretation is about, you know, you look at an experiment and that causes the quantum mechanical wave function to collapse onto this result or that result. And therefore it's all about an uh, interrelationship between an observer and the observed. Eh, yeah, I get it. Some people will say that. But I don't think Bohr ever really felt that he'd gotten to grips with that relationship. And so I think the the most um, accurate description of the Copenhagen approach, Bohr's approach, is just use quantum mechanics as an algorithm. Don't worry about what it means. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy. Peace.